The Forum at 8 with Sakina Kamwendo on AM Live, turning the spotlight on the big issues and the people behind them. It's nine minutes after eight. Welcome to the Forum at Eight here on AM Live. And of course, uh, there was an email that I read right at the top of the beginning of the show. And I'll read it again in just a while. Uh, but of course, the lines are open as well. If you'd like to call in and join in the discussion, the number is 0891-104-208. You can also SMS us on the number 34701. That comes at a cost of one rand. Or you can tweet or Facebook us at AM Live on SAFM or at Sakina Kamwendo. Now, this morning on the forum at eight, we discussing uh, we are discussing rather uh, decolonization of our South African institutions of higher learning. Now, there's been a long-standing debate about decolonizing our institutions of higher learning, and especially in the wake of the student protests for free education, there have also been renewed calls um, uh, to change the curriculum to be more Afrocentric, if nothing else. Now, students want diverse, representative teaching bodies, and also so curricula that aren't necessarily rooted in Europe or the global north as a reference. And um, some academics have responded by saying that this would limit the scope of South Africa's universities. Do you agree with that? So on the forum at 8 this morning, we will look at this call to decolonize our higher uh, learning institutions and what the process should entail. And joining us uh, for this discussion this morning is Dr. Loazi Lushaba from the Department of Political Studies at the University of Cape Town, and he's in our Seapoint studio, uh, Studios. Thanks for this morning for coming through, Dr. Lushaba. Greetings to fellow black people and to all your listeners. So, Dr. Lushaba, I think a good place to start would probably be um, just to uh, hone in on that open letter, because, you know, this is what uh, initially attracted uh, some of us here to this particular discussion uh, in this particular format, because you wrote a letter to the uh, professor, the HOD of Politics Department at the University of Cape Town, Professor Anthony Butler. Perhaps you could just talk us through why you felt the need to write that letter and perhaps a praise of it. So it so happened that I am a black person who teaches in a white institution that is anti-black called the University of Cape Town. The foundation of this institution, as it is with many other white institutions in this country and and their institutional cultures, is such that they do not have categories and perspectives with which to apprehend black modes of cognizing and black modes of being in the world. They are categories of knowledge, they are forms of knowing, they are forms of teaching, are only geared towards Western forms of life. In simpler terms, they are geared towards urban forms of life. So the only forms of knowledge about black people that are able to enter these universities and these institutions are those forms of lives of black people that turn black people away from themselves, are those forms of life that make people, black people despise themselves, that make black people begin to speak ill of their cultures, that make black people to begin to detest their own languages, that make black people at the end of their studies not to be able to speak their languages. So what happens at UCT is that I began teaching there at the beginning of this year. And I felt a need as a black person to bring into the classrooms forms of knowledge that were previously excluded by these institutions. What I did was basically not something out of this world. I invited into my first year class of politics, Introduction to Political Science, RMF activists. Now these were people who last year had been involved at UCT driven by their selflessness, driven by their unconditional love for themselves and for black people, who had been involved in struggles to change the institutional culture at UCT. And I thought that it was going to be useful to my first-year students to engage with these RMF activists, not to agree with them, but to critically engage with them so that they would hear for themselves from the actual dramatis personae, those who were involved in Rhodes Must Fall, as to what 
decolonizing higher education meant for them as to how these activists, these black activists, who, as I've said, are driven by unconditional love for the land and unconditional love for black people, how they experienced state violence, how they were criminalized, suspended, and ultimately some of them expelled from the university. So they came to class. They taught these first-year students revolutionary songs. Now, one of the ways in which black people transmit knowledge is through song and dance. For us, these things are not aesthetics. For us, these are mediums through which we pass on knowledge from one generation to the next. For those of us who study non-white forms of life, who study black modes of being in the world, we know that amongst black people, there are songs we sing in moments of sadness. There are songs we sing in moments of happiness. When a child is born, we sing. When a child dies, we sing. When someone marries, we sing. In all of these songs are carried our forms of being, the integrity of black life. So these RMF activists introduced the first year class to these revolutionary songs, but they also spoke to them about RMF. And I thought that this was befitting of that class because in that week I was teaching students also about colonialism, coloniality, and decolonization. Two, in that week I was also teaching students about what is called political culture and political socialization. Now, lo and behold, only 45 minutes of the lecture, the RMF activists, you know, did exactly what I've just described. When I finish the class, I get to my office at 5 p.m. My class is between 4 and 5, and I get to my office. Before I go home, I check my emails. I see an email from the head of department who says that he believes that my class was disrupted. I must tell him what exactly happened. And I responded with one line. Everything that happened in class was planned. It was part of the lesson for the day. A couple of days later, Again, I receive, I am called into the office. Now, the HOD suggests that we had a discussion. No, we did not have a discussion. When he called me to his office, what he did was basically it was an attempt to make manifest the insidious power of whiteness. At UCT, white people, white academics, white administrators have a certain invisible power over black people. It's not it does not necessarily follow from their positions. You may be a lecturer with your fellow white academic at UCT, but they all know that over a black academic, they have certain power that is invisible that can, they can exercise over you. So when the HOD called me, he wanted to make manifest this insidious power that you find in white institutions that white academics have over black people. And so he said that he had received complaints from parents and students who thought that there was no educational value in what had happened in the said class. I did not respond. I thanked him because I saw that in that discussion, it was not two colleagues, one senior and one junior, you know, communicating and trying to arrive at, you know, a mutually agreeable ground, even though they disagree. He had intended to basically cow me because I'm on probation. Here is how this power works. I'm on probation. So he had hoped that, you know, by telling me about my teaching not being responsible and me having, you know, neglected uh, or being, you know, uh, in, in having committed dereliction of duty, I would immediately panic and think that this is the same person who in a few years' time would have to sign over my probation about my teaching, about the quality of you know, my intellectual maturity and emotional maturity. So I thanked him, and I left the office. And later that day, he wrote me a warning letter. Now, he didn't call it a warning letter, but it was evident in the email he sent me that he was writing me a warning letter. Again, he was building a case that would go into my file so that a few years down the line, when my probation period comes to an end, then this letter would be whipped out that I had actually conducted myself in an unbecoming manner in my teaching. So I decided that perhaps I needed to put a stop to this and I decided to write an open letter to him. And in the open letter, there are two things that I want to make obvious. One is that if indeed the HOD had received complaints from parents and students 
As for the students, why did the students, because I was present throughout class, why did the students jump me and went straight to a white head of department? You know why? It is because as a black academic in these white institutions, you are performing a role that appropriately belongs to white people. You are not the real thing. Standing there in front of the class, you are not the real thing. You are a proxy for something else, for a white academic who just happens not to be there, who just happens because of transformation exigencies has been displaced by you. So white students see through you. You are transparent. So these white students simply jumped me without asking me any question and went to a white head of department to complain. Because between white students and a white head of department, there is a mutually agreed perspective, a predetermined conclusion that a black person cannot constitute the real academic. He or she is just a proxy. So I needed to point that out in my open letter. The second thing is, if indeed the HOD received complaints from parents, I then asked in, in, in the letter and to him, do all parents, black and white, have the same access to a white head of department who lives in the most expensive suburbs of Cape Town? Do black parents from Gangelis, or from Ekiani, from Emadate, from the poor black slums of South Africa, do these black parents have the same access to the HOD? And when does it become necessary for a white HOD to balance the views of white parents with those of black parents who do not have the cultural capital to communicate with him. It was blatant racism that was happening here. Now, the last point I needed also to raise in the letter is that, you see, white people do not know our songs. White people do not know, you know, the meanings that are encapsulated in our forms of cognizing. How do they conclude a priori that our forms of singing, our forms of revolutionary songs and protest are meaningless. It is because modern thought categorizes us as black people as residing outside the purview of knowledge. The boundary of rationality and reason excludes us as black people. Now, UCT and all these white institutions in this country have been at the forefront of the production of that modern knowledge that considers us as black people to reside behind the boundaries of rationality and knowledge. And so I needed to point out to the head of department that actually what he was doing, whether consciously and unconsciously here, he was reinforcing a centuries-long project of modern rationalist thinking that considers us as black people to lie outside of reason and rationality. He was considering us just as modern thought and rationality considers us as people who are incapable of teaching anything to the modern world. There is nothing about us as black people that is capable of adding value to modern knowledge. Modern knowledge appropriately belongs to the white world and to white people. And I needed to correct those things. And I'm going to shut up on this point. It is, <laughs> it is that... The problem we have in these white institutions is that when they employ people like me, Luazilu Shaba, it is that all they want out of me is my black skin color. I'm not expected to do anything more than bring into the political science corridor and into the classroom my black skin color so that the nonsensical transformation exigencies that have been set can be ticked on. All they want from me is my black skin color. But the, the, the mistake they made at UCT is that they did not tell me that all they needed was my black skin color. I assumed that they wanted me to bring forms of teaching, you know, that are decolonizing, forms of teaching that have for centuries been previously excluded at UCT. So would I be correct then to say that uh, when we talk <clears throat> about, you know, uh, decolonization, it is a very intricate process that we are talking about, especially given our racist past as a nation and, and those legacies that at the same time also need to be dismantled. Uh, because you look at some of the questions, uh, people are struggling first and foremost with the very notion of decolonization. Um, I mean, as epitomized here in this letter uh, that I got from one of our listeners, uh, Patricia, and I'm just trying to find that letter. And uh, Patricia says... What exactly is decolonized education um, that these protesting university students are demanding? I don't understand it. 
How can subjects such as maths, physics, chemistry, biology, geography, international history, foreign language studies, accountancy, etc. be decolonized? It sounds like they want education to be downgraded to junk status. Or am I missing the point completely? Please enlighten me if you can. That was from Patricia. Now, there is something underlying that letter. In as much as it purports to be asking a question, what would decolonized education look like? It's already reached a conclusion. The conclusion is that if you decolonize, you are downgrading. It assumes that value is in the education as is today. And anything other than the value of education as is today would amount, you know, to turning education into a junk status. Now, you can see that it is a question asked in bad faith. But we shall enlighten them, even though they ask these questions in bad faith, even though they think that black people are incapable of adding to knowledge. Now, the starting point would be that you say we have a racist past. It's not a past. It's the present. This country that we live in called South Africa, the modern South Africa we live in, is a racist, anti-black country. It's a country that detests everything about black people. From the government to the institutions of higher learning, we have modern institutions that are anti-black, that consider black people as necessarily many and eliminable. You have a black government that kills black people every day and any day because it considers them to be objects, not as human beings. You have a government that kills people and the status quo continues or life continues normally because necessarily black people are fit for that kind of treatment. So it's not a, it's not in our past. Mm. Now, <clears throat> let's begin here what would a decolonized education look like. Now, the first start, the starting point would be to recognize that institutions like UCT, VETS, Stellenbosch and all of these institutions are institutions that are founded whose normative values are racist values. These institutions were designed by racists in order to exclude not just black people but to also exclude black knowledges. Now, there is something odd that happens in this country. It is that people think when they've gone to UCT or Vets or Stellenbosch, they've gotten good education. Now, a racist institution cannot offer good education. Racism and good education cannot cannot coexist in one institution. A racist institution of necessity will give you racist education. It is precisely that education that has produced people like those who are asking, what would a decolonized education look like? Now, let me hasten to answer the question. Now, knowledge in the modern world, as it begins in Europe, was meant for a category of people who were considered human. The counterpoint to that category of people who were considered human were those who were considered non-beings. Those who were considered non-beings are us, black people. So white people do not know what it feels like to be a non-being. They do not know what it means or it feels like to be excluded from modern knowledge because modern knowledge speaks to them. Now, if you have modern knowledge that is constituted on the basis of an assumption that non-Western people are non-beings, it means that this education is dehumanizing to us. First, a decolonized education would be one that would seek to rehumanize us as black people. It is education that restores to us as black people our integrity of being. It is one that would consider us as people who are capable of agency and thought. Now, you get a sense when you study in these institutions that our education basically reinforces the assumption that everything black has to be negated. I teach at UCT. If you take the large number of black students who go to UCT who have come mainly, who come mainly from white schools and another aberration, Racist white schools that are called good schools. Good schools cannot be racist. Now, these students, they come to UCT at the end of three years or four years. What do they look like? Black people who have gone to UCT, they do not speak their own languages. What do they look like? They detest their culture. What do they look like? They talk of those black people who for ages have made their existence possible, who make it possible for them today to say, I, they talk of those people as being trapped in a 
traditional past in an aberrant past. They speak of the cultures of those people as being, you know, aberrant. Now, how can that be good education that alienates people from their cultures, that alienates people from their languages, that alienates people from their own, you know, people? You have students who come to UCT who come to VETS from Gangelizwe, from Kaelicha, from Emlazi, from Guamashu, from Maspumele. But when they leave these institutions, they do not want to go back there. They are not enthused to go back there. They want to go to the white suburbs. Whose problems are they going to resolve in the white suburbs? They leave their people languishing in all sorts of problems in the locations in the rural areas and run to the suburbs. Whose problems are they going there to solve? White people don't have problems. Whose problems are they going to resolve? But two, if they now think that the existence of those they've left behind in the locations, they've left behind in the rural areas, is not fitting for them, who is it fit for? What kind of black people are they if they now begin to think that there is an existence that is fit for other black people, but because they you know, have seen what whiteness looks like, are no longer fit for that existence. There's something wrong with that kind of an education. So a decolonized education would be one that enthuses us, that fills us with enthusiasm and need and energy to go back to our own communities and resolve the problems that face our communities. The Forum at 8 with Sakina Kamwendo on AM Live, turning the spotlight on the big issues and the people behind them. Thank you so much, Rowena. And back to the Forum at 8, discussing uh, decolonization of our institutions of higher learning this morning and what it probably would uh, entail to get to that point. And our guest this morning is Dr. Luazi Lushaba, and he is from the Department of Political Studies at the University of Western Cape, joining us from our Seapoint studios in Cape Town. Now, uh, Dr. Lushaba, as you heard Rowena Bird on the show after this, will be uh, honing in on the sciences and that's where we park the conversation before the news break so uh, is it possible how do you decolonize the sciences now <clears throat> here is the starting point anything colonial can be decolonized so if the sciences are colonial sciences it means then of necessity that it's logical that they can be decolonized but here again for the doubting Thomas is what we mean about a decolonized, you know, education. You know, white people have the same cognitive capability to speak Isizulu, is Kosa, is Tsonga, just as we all nasalate English here, black people nasalate English in this country. So imagine if doctors in this country, black and white, were expected to at least speak one indigenous language. What would the relations between doctor-patient, you know, look like? What kind of knowledge would doctors be able to learn about the sicknesses of black people? Would they not access a world that is not accessible now to them about what it means to be sick as a black person? Would they not hear of how sickness for black people is not just a bodily matter, but is also a manifestation of a disequilibrium between the ancestral and the physical world? But further than that, You know, what colonized education looks like is that it exteriorizes the knowledge from the knower, meaning that the value that education has is as a commodity. The value of your education, including yourself, is basically as a commodity because it enables you to consume other commodities. It enables you to buy a cheap car, to buy a cheap house. Knowledge ceases to have value in and of itself. Because in this country you have engineers, UCT produces engineers, VETS produces engineers of different hues, structural engineers, civil engineers. But why is it that these many engineers who construct wonderful stadiums and wonderful urban roads, why is it that one day they can't just they can't just put their heads together and figure out what is the model for rural roads in South Africa? You know why? It's because colonial knowledge has value only as a commodity. They won't do it until someone promises to pay them. But if you had a decolonized education that says to people, knowledge has value in and of itself, 
It's not meant to enable you consume other commodities. It's something that you use to resolve problems of your society. Engineers in this country would have taken a day or two to figure out just how to resolve the problem of rural roads in South Africa. Or think of a different ethic that would infuse medical practice in this country. If doctors did not think that your sickness is an opportunity to manifest the commercial value of their education. Now you have all sorts of things where doctors, you know, for one day offer free services, you know, to the country. There's no nation that was ever cured in one day. Why is it that they can infuse their everyday practice with an ethic of care for their people? Now, because education, as is today, only teaches you that its value is as a commodity that enables you to consume other commodities. If you had learned of education as something else that has value in and of itself that enables you to resolve your society's problems, how is it that this country cannot resolve just a simple problem of racism? You produce, you know, graduates every year in the social sciences. They can't resolve a simple problem of racism. It's because their education is a commodity. Decolonized education is one that says that education is not a commodity. Its value is not in enabling you to consume other commodities, but in resolving the problems of your own country. Now, the problem in terms of content is that, you know, the philosophy of science... The philosophy of science excludes certain categories. It excludes certain forms of being in the world. It doesn't find, you know, a necessity to understand, for instance, indigenous practices. It doesn't have the language with which to apprehend indigenous practices. And so this is what happens. When medicine tries to integrate you know, non-Western forms of medicine, they are called indigenous forms of medicine, suggesting that there is medicine proper. This other form of medicine needs to be qualified. Why don't you integrate those forms of practices into medical practice? It is because modern knowledge and modern thought has never imagined that there is anything that would come out of the Western world that will come outside of the boundaries of the rational modern Western world and inform the knowledge. So what we need to do first is to rewrite the philosophy of science and write a different philosophy of science that enables us explain questions and you know phenomena that otherwise are considered to lie outside of knowledge. So our forms of knowledge are not considered knowledge because they are considered to lie outside of science. So it doesn't matter how many things I mentioned to you that are capabilities of non-Western people. The point that you are going to make is that, but that's not science. It is because you come from a perspective that considers, or from a philosophy of science, that considers science to have a character, a certain character, and that character is complete, and that character comes out of Europe's transition from the medieval to the modern period. That character of science is white. That character of science excludes non-Western forms of science and non-Western forms of cognizing. Well, we're going to open the lines now. Speaking doc- to Dr. Loazi Lushaba. Oh, it's blazing this morning. So 0891-104-208, let's hear from our listeners. Uh, first up is Vuyo calling us from East London. Good morning, Vuyo. Yeah, good morning, Sakina. I seem to have one problem first with your guest. Mm-hmm. You see, he seems to talk in a dualistic fashion, black and white. He needs first to understand between black and white, there is a lot of gray, and he doesn't seem to say anything about that. Secondly, he makes one mistake that most people make, that blacks are like this and white are like this. There are a lot of blacks who think differently. So for him to come and speak on behalf of blacks, that white oppressing blacks, and a black person, I don't agree with him. I don't subscribe to his values. For instance, my parents, especially my mother, was a traditionalist. I learned a lot about rituals. I learned a lot about my culture. In 2006, I said to my parents and said to them, I have, thank you for helping me. I understand how black culture works. I understand how science works. I choose science because science 
liberates your mind. My culture suppresses your creativity. So I took a conscious decision and said, turn to colonialists, because without them, with our cultures, would have been far backwards. That is a conscious decision. So therefore, I, my request to government is have two types of institutions. Have institutions for those who want to decolonize. I will choose to go to the other one. Don't force us. Don't force all the natives. Choose. That is freedom. Choose. Let him choose if he want to. But I don't want what he says, although I'm a black person. Thank you very much. Thank you, Vuyo. In East London, Jenny is calling from Somerset West. Good morning, Jenny. Good morning, Sakina, and good morning to your guest. Sakina, I would like to suggest that if South Africa had not been colonized, there would be no education at all. And it doesn't stop at the education. If, if black people are so anti-colonial, then they mustn't have white weddings, they mustn't wear blonde wigs, and the biggest one of all is they must not play soccer because that's the colonial game. Okay there, Jenny in Somerset West. Uh, anonymous, you're in Cape Town. Good morning. Hi, SK, and good morning to your doctor. I salute him. Uh, anonymous, uh, um, SK, I'm going to be having one question. My, the, your, the doctor must not take me wrong. My question is being honest. We all know the history that m- most of African countries, we are colonized. Yes, I agree with him by saying that some consider themselves superior to black. Color, to me, doesn't matter, I'm sorry. But I said I agree with him in that matter why, because if you study in Africa, you go to Europe, with your qualification, they won't admit you immediately at the workplace to say you're educated. They would love you to go back to the to study again. But when they come down to Africa, with whatever paper they have, they are considered higher. For that, I agree with me, with him. But here's my question. What education he himself, with many so-called doctor and teacher got, if he says is a bad education, colonized education, that means he's not a doctor. If he can say publicly now in the national radio that since I had a bad education, which means colonized education, then I'm no longer a doctor. I say no to my diploma. I say no to my qualification. Then we can move ahead with that. But if he still holds in that degree of saying he's a doctor and bringing that knowledge in national radio, now saying that we can decolonize, then I say it's not fair. Okay. So if you can answer that question, where did he get that knowledge? What education? What university? Is it not the same that he's calling now colonized education? Why is it a problem now? But while he's busy enjoying that qualification. Thank Got you. you. Thanks, Anonymous. Let's go to Germiston. Good morning, Rex. Um, morning, uh, uh, Sakina. I, I think your guest has come to deepen the depth of uh, mediocrity and give them um, confidence and credence to those who do not want to exist in a competitive world. He has come with a very racist uh, rant, and we do not need that. Because um, the reason why I'm study- saying this is this. I, I, I studied at VETS. I, I did a postgraduate in management at VETS. All during the time of my studies, I never, I mean, in management uh, uh, strategy and all that, all that, I never saw nor even experienced any time the, the, the courses were divided or, or into racial lines or racial things mentioned in that. In physics, I want your guest to tell me what atom or molecule is in his own local language. And if he cannot say that, then he saw, I mean, can he ever invent any of those things in his own local language? I, 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 I wonder what he's up to. And okay. not subscribe to him. Why would, you think it would be, why would you think it would be impossible to develop the terminology for those in indigenous languages? Is, I, I am saying it is not impossible. But, Sekina, if you attended a university, maybe you studied engineering or something like that, can you ever say one subject in engineering that is divided along racial lines? The same subject that is taught in the United States in engineering is the same that is taught here. Is there any racial differences in engineering? Okay, I hear you. I mean, are there any, are there any racial differences in engineering? Are there black and white in engineering? I mean, as a subject. 
We shall answer that question. At least Dr. Uh, Loshaba will do that, I'm sure. Uh, let's go to Simone in Belito. Good morning, Simone. Morning, Sakina, and to your guest. Um, I basically just wanted to, um, first of all, I just wanted to say, you know, it's, it's so so awesome to hear a lot of the callers kind of express a more unified kind of like view of, of South Africa and of the world. So that's very heartening. Um, except for the one lady who was a little bit, yeah, but anyway, um, the point I wanted to make is that I think, you know, I, I absolutely agree that there is a very colonial slant to a lot of the subject matter in our universities, and that absolutely has to be addressed, you know, especially in, in the social sciences, in, in, um, um, you know, those sorts of places. But I do think that one has to be careful to, you know, to use the, the proverbial throw the baby out with the bathwater, you know. Um, science is science. Science is a process. It's, it's an approach to knowledge. There are different approaches to knowledge, um, and we judge the, the value of those different approaches to knowledge based on uh, the, the results they give us. And, you know, to say that science is a, a white Western thing is... It's, it's really incorrect to say, you know. We say that our, we, we, we talk about how math is built on Arabic numerals, that algebra is an Arabic word. Um, you know, the numerals that we use in turn came from India. You know, we got a lot of knowledge that we integrate in the science today from trade and, in, and in interaction with ancient China. So to say that science is, is a Western thing, I think is, is to betray a misunderstanding of science's origins. Science is a process of acquiring understanding about phenomena through trial and error, through, you know, observing something, making a prediction, and then testing that prediction to see if your, if your understanding is correct. And the reason that science doesn't integrate, say, more traditional um, modes of knowledge, you know, from religion, from mythology, and, and that's, that's as true of um, ancient European tradition and mythology as it is of African tradition and mythology, is because when you test those against the principles of science, they don't bear the same knowledge that, that the scientific process does. It's a mechanistic approach to the world, which arguably is incomplete, but to say that that science is somehow a colonial construct is, yeah, you know. Okay. Yeah. That's well, right, yes, right. Let's park it there because we want to get some answers in as well. Uh, Tim in Cape Town, good morning to you. Morning. Um, I just like the, the, the lady before was quite uh, clear in her explanation of, of science being um, coming uh, originating from uh, multiple disciplines. Um, but your guest, I'd like to just support him in his, um, I'm actually an architecture, and his explanation of roads for look at road book, that sort of thing, and just give an example. When we were studying at UCT and back just before the changeover from apartheid, um, one of the subjects we had to do was measured drawing. And part of the process and measure a colonial building. And a, f- a group of us um, decided we weren't going to do that. Uh, we wanted to go and basically look at how local people had been living during apartheid for quite some time and document that rather than a colonial building. Um, and for that, we were actually given the History Measured Drawing Prize because we actually went into Masipumalele, uh, Old Site 5, and went into everybody's homes, documented everything, and I think that's what your guest is trying to allude to, I think, uh, is that it's not that you, they're mutually exclusive. It's that when you tackle a problem, you need to approach it with a context already um, and, and use that context to inform your, how you move forward rather than just in, in architecture students going to the international magazines and looking at the fancy building there and using that to inform there. So I think I, I, I can see where he's coming from. Just a second quick one. Um, your guest seems to be um, upset at the choice of black students to move from the township to another area. Um, can you just explain 
why that them making a choice for themselves bothers him. I'll, I'll listen on the radio. Thanks for that, okay. Tim. And let's hear from Muzi in uh, Kwanyamazana. Good morning. Good morning, Fatina. Good morning to Lazi. Please go ahead, Muzi. Lazi, sounds like the Lula in Shogoyam in a What I'm saying, I'm saying you are the one the greatest. This country is protecting the white monopoly, white people. When we came into power in 1994, we were supposed to create our own universities, teaching our kids our own history, designing our own concept in terms of in terms of engineering whatsoever in our own indigenous languages. I can put to an example, if I can say to you, uh, this country, they never told us the true history. Go to Robben Island. They will tell you it's one political prisoner. But there's one political prisoner, which even, even my kids, they don't know about him. That's South Africa. Okay. Think about ourselves. As black people, Sakina, if I can ask you a, a direct question to you, I'm not offending you. Can you speak <laughs> maybe one indigenous language? And what do you think? I don't know. I've heard you this morning pronouncing Muzin, but in a different way. It tells me that uh, what was Loazi was saying that uh, African child go to those uh, English schools. We forget our own languages. Sakina Kamwendo on SAFM. Well, Dr. Shaba, we are fast running out of time, so uh, perhaps just jump in and answer as many of those questions as you can. Now we we'll begin here. There is nothing that is called knowledge that stands outside there in the empirical world that we go to retrieve and it comes to us pure and complete. Knowledge is something that we constitute ourselves as human beings. The boundaries of knowledge are what we constitute as human beings. So when we decide that black traditional practices are not knowledge, it is not because they are not knowledge, it is because we've decided that they are not knowledge. So what that means is that there is an inseparable dialectic between knowledge and power. When you control knowledge, you exercise power. You see, the white people who control knowledge production in this country have control over Vuyo's mind. The reason he speaks like that is because white rationalist thought has control over his mind because, remember, a dominant ideology manifests its dominance when even those who are oppressed by it begin to speak in its defense. How do you speak in defense of a knowledge system that alienates you from your parents that brought you up, that alienates you from the practices of your grandmothers and your grandfathers who made it possible for centuries for you to today exist? We must know for always that there is an inseparable dialectic between knowledge and power. You know why white people are holding so fastidiously to this notion of science as pure? It is because the day we rewrite the philosophy of science and make it more expansive, they would lose control over our minds. They would lose control over us as objects of their own knowledge. What that would mean is that on that day, Occidental authority or white authority over black people would have vanished. Because the basis, the precondition of white people's superiority over us is not money. It's not that they have land. It is that they have knowledge and they exercise that knowledge over us. They need a discourse that legitimizes their superiority over us. And what is that discourse? It is the discourse that science belongs to them. You cannot bring anything, you know, to science. Now, I'll give you again an example. You know, there is something called um, urban geography in this country. Now, people are taught, taught spatial planning because, again, Spatial planning in this country and architecture in this country are taught in the way in which they are taught. 
you have spatial planning in this country that reinforces the very apartheid geography. Look at how our cities are planned. Do they enforce or do they encourage integration? And then people tell me that architecture is a pure science. You can't bring anything. It's only drawings. Architecture is spatial planning, how you use space in order to model people's interaction. Space is not just physical space. Space is that physical space and how you occupy it and how you utilize it and what kind of interactions are made possible by its organization. That's what architecture is about. That's what spatial planning is about. Now, if you have a colonial architecture you know, uh, module system, what it does, it's exactly what it has done in South Africa. You have an architectural system, a spatial planning system in this country that reinforces the same apartheid divisions. Now, it's not a choice when you leave black people as a black person and abandon your own people and go to live in white areas. That's not a choice. That's a structural dictate of a modern structuralist society that says that because you have education whose value is that it enables you rent in a white area, you must leave the black areas because you have now internalized certain structures of whiteness. There are things that you now need in your life. I need Wi-Fi. I need all of those other things that are not in the location. Don't those people in the location need those things? The reason they are there is because there is a structure that produces them as black people as being fit for that kind of existence. Science must be called upon to resolve those problems so that you do not take black people away from... Black people in this country do not own wealth. The only wealth black people own in this country is us, the few of us who are educated with a critical mind. We cannot abandon our people because their only hope is us, those of us who have internalized critical education. Dr. Lushaba, let's put a pause on it because I'm already getting comments here that we should bring you back. We should broaden the debate. So we'll do just that. But thank you this morning for engaging us. I thank you very much. And I thank black people for loving themselves. Again, I receive, I am called into the office. Now, the HOD suggests that we had a discussion. No, we did not have a discussion. When he called me to his office, what he did was basically it was an attempt to make manifest the insidious power of whiteness. At UCT, white people, white academics, white administrators have a certain invisible power over black people. It's not it does not necessarily follow from their positions. You may be a lecturer with your fellow white academic at UCT, but they all know that over a black academic, they have certain power that is invisible that can, they can exercise over you. So when the HOD called me, he wanted to make manifest this insidious power that you find in white institutions that white academics have over black people. And so he said that he had received complaints from parents and students who thought that there was no educational value in what had happened in the said class. I did not respond. I thanked him because I saw that in that discussion, it was not two colleagues, one senior and one junior, you know, communicating and trying to arrive at, you know, a mutually agreeable ground, even though they disagree. He had intended to basically cow me because I'm on probation. Here is how this power works. I'm on probation. So he had hoped that, you know, by telling me about my teaching not being responsible and me having, you know, a neglected uh, or being, you know, uh, in, in having committed dereliction of duty, I would immediately panic and think that this is the same person who in a few years' time would have to sign over my probation about my teaching, about the quality of you know, my intellectual maturity and emotional maturity. So I thanked him, and I left the office. And later that day, he wrote me a warning letter. Now, he didn't call it a warning letter, but it was evident in the email he sent me that he was writing me a warning letter. Again, he was building a case that would go into my file so that a few years down the line, when my probation period comes to an end, then this letter would be whipped out that I had actually conducted myself in an unbecoming manner in my teaching. So I decided from the actual dramatis personae, those who were involved in Roads Must Fall, as to what 
decolonizing higher education meant for them as to how these activists, these black activists, who, as I've said, are driven by unconditional love for the land and unconditional love for black people, how they experienced state violence, how they were criminalized, suspended, and ultimately some of them expelled from the university. So they came to class. They taught these first-year students revolutionary songs. Now, one of the ways in which black people transmit knowledge is through song and dance. For us, these things are not aesthetics. For us, these are mediums through which we pass on knowledge from one generation to the next. For those of us who study non-white forms of life, who study black modes of being in the world, we know that amongst black people, there are songs we sing in moments of sadness. There are songs we sing in moments of happiness. When a child is born, we sing. When a child dies, we sing. When someone marries, we sing. In all of these songs are carried our forms of being, the integrity of black life. So these RMF activists introduced the first year class to these revolutionary songs, but they also spoke to them about RMF. And I thought that this was befitting of that class because in that week I was teaching students also about colonialism, coloniality, and decolonization. Two, in that week I was also teaching students about what is called political culture and political socialization. Now, lo and behold, only 45 minutes of the lecture, the RMF activists, you know, did exactly what I've just described. When I finish the class, I get to my office at 5 p.m. My class is between 4 and 5, and I get to my office. Before I go home, I check my emails. I see an email from the head of department who says that he believes that my class was disrupted. I must tell him what exactly happened. And I responded with one line. Everything that happened in class was planned. It was part of the lesson for the day. A couple of days later... The Forum at 8 with Sakina Kamwendo on AM Live, turning the spotlight on the big issues and the people behind them. It's nine minutes after eight. Welcome to the Forum at 8 here on AM Live. And of course, uh, there was an email that I read right at the top of the beginning of the show. And I'll read it again in just a while. Uh, but of course, the lines are open as well. If you'd like to call in and join in the discussion, the number is 891 You can also SMS us on the number 34701. That comes at a cost of one rand. Or you can tweet or Facebook us at AM Live on SAFM or at Sakina Kamwendo. Now, this morning on the forum at eight, we discussing uh, we are discussing rather uh, decolonization of our South African institutions of higher learning. Now, there's been a long-standing debate about decolonizing our institutions of higher learning, and especially in the wake of the student protests for free education, there have also been renewed calls um, uh, to change the curriculum to be more Afrocentric, if nothing else. Now, students want diverse, representative teaching bodies, and also so curricula that aren't necessarily rooted in Europe or the global north as a reference. And um, some academics have responded by saying that this would limit the scope of South Africa's universities. Do you agree with that? So on the forum at 8 this morning, we will look at this call to decolonize our higher uh, learning institutions and what the process should entail. And joining us uh, for this discussion this morning is Dr. Loazi Lushaba from the Department of Political Studies at the University of Cape Town, and he's in our Seapoint studio, uh, Studios. Thanks for this morning for coming through, Dr. Lushaba. Greetings to fellow black people and to all your listeners. So, Dr. Lushaba, I think a good place to start would probably be um, just to uh, hone in on that open letter, because, you know, this is what uh, initially attracted uh, some of us here to this particular discussion uh, in this particular format, because you wrote a letter to the uh, professor, the HOD of politics department at the University of Cape Town. That perhaps I needed to put a stop to this. And I decided to write an open letter to him. And in the open letter, there are two things that I want to make obvious. One is that if indeed the HOD had received complaints from parents and students, as for the students, why did the students, because I was present throughout class, why did the students jump me 
and went straight to a white head of department. You know why? It is because as a black academic in these white institutions, you are performing a role that appropriately belongs to white people. You are not the real thing. Standing there in front of the class, you are not the real thing. You are a proxy for something else, for a white academic who just happens not to be there, who just happens because of transformation exigencies has been displaced by you. So white students see through you. You are transparent. So these white students simply jumped me without asking me any question and went to a white head of department to complain. Because between white students and a white head of department, there is a mutually agreed perspective, a predetermined conclusion that a black person cannot constitute the real academic. He or she is just a proxy. So I needed to point that out in my open letter. The second thing is, if indeed the HOD received complaints from parents, I then asked in, in, in the letter and to him, do all parents, black and white, have the same access to a white head of department who lives in the most expensive suburbs of Cape Town? Do black parents from Gangelis, or from Ekiani, from Emadadeni, from the poor black slums of South Africa, do these black parents have the same access to the HOD? And when does it become necessary for a white HOD to balance the views of white parents with those of black parents who do not have the cultural capital to communicate with him. It was blatant racism that was happening here. Now, the last point I needed also to raise in the letter is that, you see, white people do not know our songs. White people do not know, you know, the mean. Professor Anthony Butler, perhaps you could just talk us through why you felt the need to write that letter and perhaps a praise of it. So it so happened that I am a black person who teaches in a white institution that is anti-black called the University of Cape Town. The foundation of this institution, as it is with many other white institutions in this country and in and their institutional cultures is such that they do not have categories and perspectives with which to apprehend black modes of cognizing and black modes of being in the world. They are categories of knowledge, they are forms of knowing, they are forms of teaching are only geared towards Western forms of life. In simpler terms, they are geared towards urban forms of life. So the only forms of knowledge about black people that are able to enter these universities and these institutions are those forms of lives of black people that turn black people away from themselves, are those forms of life that make people, black people despise themselves, that make black people begin to speak ill of their cultures, that make black people to begin to detest their own languages, that make black people at the end of their studies not to be able to speak their languages. So what happens at UCT is that I began teaching there at the beginning of this year. And I felt a need as a black person to bring into the classrooms forms of knowledge that were previously excluded by these institutions. What I did was basically not something out of this world. I invited into my first year class of politics, Introduction to Political Science, RMF activists. Now these were people who last year had been involved at UCT driven by their selflessness, driven by their unconditional love for themselves and for black people, who had been involved in struggles to change the institutional culture at UCT. And I thought that it was going to be useful to my first-year students to engage with these RMF activists, not to agree with them, but to critically engage with them so that they would hear for themselves 